So let's take a look now uh, into the future at which human beings are notoriously poor. But what do you see changing in the management of uh, pseudomonas infections going forward? I think going forward, I think we will have rapid diagnostics that tell us actually the susceptibilities very quickly. Okay. Certainly in blood, um, I think their application to the respiratory tract is going to be a little bit more challenging because of the colonization versus infection issue. But I think for the blood, uh, you know, when Marin started really contributing this data, I think that's that, that's almost ready for prime time. Uh, I think we're going to see roles re-examined for the use of monoclonals as adjunctive therapy in these things. Uh, whether they're ever going to be cost effective, I think, is going to be a very, very challenging issue. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in vaccine uh, development for Pseudomonas. Uh, it's hard to identify who you need to vaccinate, and the vaccine effect doesn't seem to be very pronounced. So I think that's kind of fallen off the table in the current situation. And then I think you're going to see a lot more emphasis on prevention generally as we get better and better at doing it. Source control, too. Absolutely. I yeah. also see, I also see more of the antibiotic initiation and maintenance falling in the hands of infectious disease doctors and stewardship. Far of course more you do. To, to maybe <laughs> not to, but I, I think it's a clear trend and I think it's, you know, it's, we talk about only oncologists give chemotherapy, even though chemotherapy can only affect, as Andy said, the person in front of you, but everyone is prescribing antibiotics and, and basically producing resistance that affect everyone. So I, I, this is one of the changes that I see. I, another change which is remote, I think, is we are going to see more targeted therapies for pseudomonas, not just biologics, but right. also small molecules that target pseudomonas specifically. And maybe into the future, we'll see more of those dural lens factor inhibitors, but I don't see any, any of those. We had a hope you know, 10, 20 years ago that by this time, we'll see some of those coming, but maybe, maybe in, in 10, 20, 30 years. I don't know. To me, pseudomonas has been the most frustrating bug I can imagine. It's a nasty bug. It kills people, and it's hard to treat. It's a bad trilogy there, isn't it? It's a trifecta of death. Don't like this bug. <laughs> what is in the pipeline? going forward, other than the, the, those magic bullets and the small monoclonals and whatever. What's coming up? Yeah, there's a couple, th I mean, Andy had touched on them earlier, but, but one is imipenem relobactam. Uh, relobactam takes care of kind of the AMP-C part of the imipenem resistance. And what you'll see is it actually restores a lot more, to, to Andy's point from earlier, a lot more of the pseudomonads to susceptibility to imipenem than you would have thought um, going in. Other than that, in the pseudomonal space, there's not a ton. Um, there's one agent, Cefiterical, um, which is a very interesting molecule. We don't know a lot about it yet. Um, there's not a lot of data that's out there about it yet, but it seems to retain activity. It has a very unique mechanism that it actually uses iron transport um, to get into the, to the gram-negative cell. And it, again, the in vitro data is incredibly encouraging. I mean, you name your carbapenem resistant organism of choice and it seems to have activity. Um, and so I would say that for Pseudomonas, um, those are the big ones. Uh, the rest of the pipeline in the gram negative space, which is nice now, it largely targets CRE. Um, and that's one of the issues. Okay, but that's it. So good luck on the Pseudomonas. We're, we're fighting this war, but it's not easy, is it? No. All right. You know, before we leave, I think we're gonna give each of you an opportunity to have some closing remarks without being interrupted by anyone else, including me. Um, so anything that you have a thought of, some, some pearl of wisdom you'd like to share with our audience, why don't we start with you, Dr. Golan? Uh -huh. <laughs> all right. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I would just say that you know, it all starts with a patient and ends with a patient. I think that we, part of our care has kind of gone away from old school medicine in which you were able to look at a patient and, and say how sick the patient is and how, um, to what extent the patient would benefit from therapy. And I think that before you talk about uh, broad spectrum, narrow spectrum, short therapy, long therapy, ask the question, is the patient really going to benefit from antibiotic therapy and, and from aggressive antibiotic therapy? And that's where all of it starts. Dr. Collin? Yeah, I think what I would say, uh, and this, this is a little bit of a rebuttal to what you have said earlier about how infectious disease is sort of becoming the, the, you know, the conductor of all antibiotic use, but in the intensive care unit specifically, uh, decisions have to be made quickly, and oftentimes it's the intensivist or the surgeon or maybe the anesthesiologist who's there in the trenches having to deal with that particular individual. So understanding you know, these issues related to pseudomonas and other resistant gram negatives becomes really a key factor. And I would hate to see a situation where those clinicians are not expert enough to deal with those problems and at least initiate the initial therapy for that patient because it's gonna make all the difference in the world. Okay, Dr. Pogue. 
Yeah, so I'll take the stewardship angle and, and I'll, I'll highlight to the audience that, again, the primary function of antimicrobial stewardship is to optimize patient outcomes. It's not to restrict antibiotics, it's not to de-escalate antibiotics, it's not to discontinue, it's to make patients who have infections, it's getting them on the appropriate antibiotic, the right dose, the right duration, and so on. And I actually very much agree with Dr. Koloff. I, I, I think that the, the most important way that we can do that is identifying patients who are sick, who are at high risk for drug-resistant organisms, and getting them on optimal therapy faster. All right, Dr. Shore. I'd like to end with the kind of the plea I made earlier, which was it takes a village, in the sense that it, you have a multidisciplinary group here struggling with very difficult issues at the bedside, but it also is gonna take this group to approach policymakers to get the system fixed. And by a system being fixed, I mean incentives for people to actually develop molecules that we can have at the bedside that are reasonably priced. And that actually takes having a whole different regulatory approach, intellectual property approach, reimbursement approach at a congressional level and administration level to actually engineer us out of this problem. Otherwise, we're gonna keep hitting our heads against the same wall because we're never gonna have new tools in the toolkits and there'll be minor advances here and there, but we won't have the paradigm shift that we need. And I think the experience in Europe demonstrates that you can get all those people at the table and if you look at what's going on in the UK, you look at what's going on in the EU, they're interested in coming up with pathways to change reimbursement mechanisms so that people actually get paid for not giving things when they used to get paid for giving them. People have reasons to develop antibiotics and put capital at risk. And people understand that these are unique tools that have important uses, and you never want to be calling that fire station and have them say, I'm sorry, we're not here today. And that's a policy level issue. I want to thank all of you for being here. Just a tremendous, tremendous discussion. Of course, one of our enemies, as opposed to Pseudomonas, is the clock. <laughs> and here we are. I want to thank you, too, uh, for joining us. And I hope you found this Contagion Peer Exchange discussion to be both useful and informative. I'm Dr. Peter Salgo, and I'll see you next time.